Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> First of all, let me thank the, uh, the conference organizers for uh, inviting me to come over here and uh, spend half an hour with you to talk to you a little bit about uh, fish. Um, the, um, the title of my presentation today for the next 25 minutes is uh, Nourishing the World, the Role of Fish. Professor Olsen, in his first uh, keynote address, said that we have enough food in the world. It's a matter of distribution and access. A couple of years back, if you, when I, we talk about feeding the world, feeding the 9 billion, feeding the 8 billion, feeding the 7 billion, we use the word feeding because there's food. Today I'm using a different word, nourishing the world, not feeding the world. Food we have, whether it's the right food, whether that food is the food which will give you the right nutrition, whether that food will help you to develop and improve your health, whether it will lead you to live a long life. That's the question for the next 50 years. So in that sense, what I'm trying to do for the next 20, 23 minutes is to talk to you about where fish fit into that equation of feeding the world with a nutritious food. Um, probably have the same as Professor Olson. Let's try. Yes, the left goes. Right, um, no need to explain, it's very clear. We have around um, seven and a half billion people, and we have different levels of uh, population increase um, uh, projected with a high, medium, and lower. Whatever it is, uh, we will have a very high population growth, and we are reaching nine billion very soon, and we are targeting 2030 for various projections, and we are targeting 2050 for various projections. Um, in this graph, it's very clear for you where the population is uh, growing or will be grown in basically Asia and Africa. And you can see Africa is, uh, let me try this. Which one? No. Never mind. Um, uh, and it's, it's Asia and African continents where you have the highest growth of population. This is the increase in agricultural productivity, production required to match the projected demand by 2050. The, what you see is that if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa where the highest population growth is going to be, and you will require 112% increase in food by 2050. And uh, by 2030, the UN says that you need to increase the food production by 60%. And you're going beyond 2030 and 2050, we need to double or even more the current level of production to feed the growing population. Oops. This graph shows you the people below the poverty line, which is $1.9 per day between 1990 and 2015. I think it's very, um, oh no, I don't, sorry, I need some help. Here we go. Which one is the, uh, the pointer, the right, this one? No. Oh, the, comes the expert. Ah, not here. Thank you. That's why he's a professor. I'm just not a professor. <laughs> I was holding it in the wrong direction. 
<laughs> right. Thank you. Um, so in here, all what I want to show you is the green boxes. Right? We are going down from nearly 2 billion to 700 million um, under the power line, But still, you can see how big all the rest is going down, but the Sub-Saharan Africa is still remain as a major uh, issue for uh, poverty and uh, 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 food security. Um, number of undernourished, I'm talking about undernourished because I'm talking about nourishment, I'm talking about nutrition. Number of undernourished, you can see in this, this is in millions, and this is Sub-Saharan Africa, 216 million people will be undernourished by 2030 out of the total of 637 million in the world. So one third of the global undernourishment will be in Africa. I'm talking about Africa because I'm right now I'm working in one of the poorest or rather difficult countries in Africa for the past three years. I've been working in Nigeria and where the uh, Nigeria is going to be the most populous uh, African country. Nigeria is going to be the third populous country in the world by 2040. It's going to be India, China, and Nigeria, not the United States, right? And with currently 86 million people below the poverty belt, it'll be increased to about 130 million by 2030. Um, so, there we go. Yes, undernourishment in business as usual. Business as usual means if you don't do anything, you just let it go, like what we do now. So you can still see the green sub-Saharan Africa, the undernourishment will still remain. Every rest of the world still will go down, undernourishment, even without making a special effort to reduce nourishment, undernourishment, and it will still have more than 150 million uh, undernourished people in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so if you look at it a little bit clearly, here is the stunting population, here is the overweight population, and if you look at here, stunting is gone down from 32.32 percent in 2000 to 22 percent in 2017. So we've been feeding people well, nutritious food, yes, right? And at the same time, you can still see a little bit of obesity and the overweight is increasing from 4.9 to 5.6 over 17 years. And it is happening not only in the developing developed countries, but also in many parts of the developing world. Um, and here, you see in this, the prevalent prevalence of uh, undernourishment in highs in Africa, the absolute number of undernourished uh, people. So you can see here, uh, three, Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Interesting part is that this all reducing, but this is still going up. So focus for food, focus for nutrition, for the next 50 years for the globe is Africa. 45% uh, of the child deaths from poor nutrition in the world. I'm going to go into a little bit of detail why in a minute, but a lot of children die of malnutrition, undernutrition. Why fish in this equation? Fish provides food security. I'll tell you why. Fish provides a livelihood for people and fish provides nutrition. Globally, more than one billion people obtain most of the animal protein from fish. And fish provides nutrition, in particular a micronutrients for many people, particularly for children and women of reproductive age and for the first thousand days of life, which is extremely important. And if I say perhaps even uh, it's essential. 800 million people depend on fisheries and aquaculture in the world. And uh, in aquaculture, of course, there are many people depend on aquaculture in Asia, because Asia is the beginning of aquaculture. 
nearly 90% of the global agriculture produced in Asia. And we have uh, both fishing and fish farming as primary source of income for nearly a billion, if not 800 million people. The word hidden hunger is a global problem. We, you call the word hidden hunger is for particularly for micronutrient deficiencies in human. The micronutrient deficiency, two billion people worldwide suffer from hidden hunger. Two billion out of seven and a half. One million children under five die every year from vitamin A and zinc deficiency. Where does vitamin A come from? Fish. Micronutrient deficiencies are often caused by not eating a diverse diet, including animal source foods like fish and meat. It can and lead to various conditions like impaired brain development, stunting, increased risk of disease, uh, cardiovascular uh, issues, and various uh, diseases. Fish is a package of nutrients. A fish gives you four major nutrients. One is zinc, iron, calcium, vitamin A. They are all extremely important for human diet, for keeping people healthy. Long chain omega 3s and omega 5 fatty acids, of course, in any, any fish. And then you have iodines, mainly coming from marine fish. Then you have vitamin Ds, vitamin As, iron, calcium, zinc, many other micronutrients, which are essential, particularly, as I said earlier, for reducing the hidden hunger. If you look at this table, the, in this table, tuna bones per 100 grams, tuna, not fish even, bones per 100 grams, and maize flour, 400 grams, for you could see how much calcium, iron, zinc, EPAs, and DHAs that you would get compared to the maize. I mean, it doesn't mean that please eat tuna bones, but <laughs> what we're saying is that fish is a very, very nutritious commodity to eat. If you look at this, is a contribution of fish to animal protein supply. And yellow is more than 20% of fish goes in your animal source proteins in the world. You can see the yellows. The blues are less than two grams. And you can see how much of Africa is bl light blue. Of course, there are pockets. and. This is where I come from. I'm a Sri Lankan by national. We eat 57 kilograms of fish per person per year in the country, which is very high, much higher than even here. So, unevenly distributed, fish eating world, where some people, or with an average, I will come in a minute. If you look at this graph, you have 44 to 50 grand kilograms per year in the dark areas, whereas you have less than nine in these areas. Sub-Saharan Africa, current consumption, per capita consumption is nine kilograms per year, per person. Whereas, oops, um, whereas globally, 20 kilograms, Sub-Saharan Africa, 9 to 10 kilograms, and Southeast Asia, uh, high fish countries, 38 to 40 grams. Fish come from two sources, capture and culture. Capture fisheries and culture fisheries all together, in 2018 we made 171 million tons, out of which 80 90 million tons come from aquaculture, sorry, 80 million tons from aquaculture, 90 from capture fisheries. You can see the capture fisheries, it's 
doesn't increase anymore. All what you need to feed the world with the increasing population, the increase in the production of fish in this world come from aquaculture. That's it. 53% of the fish that you eat today come from aquaculture. When I first joined FAO in 1993, I said one out of every five fish that you eat come from aquaculture. When I left FAO in 19, sorry, 2016, I said one out of every two fish that you eat come from aquaculture. It was a, one of the fastest growing food producing sectors in the world. You can see from here, and this is all freshwater fish, how, the, how much it contributes. And remember, we also have plants, aquatic plants, seaweeds, right, and also which contributes about 25% of the global production of aquatic food is, is uh, plants. Regionally, Asia produced 90%, America's 4%, Europe's 3%, Africa 2.5%, I'm sorry, nine, that's the reason why you have nine kilograms per person per year uh, consumption compared to 30, 40 in Asia. And altogether, we have 100% coming with the highest contribution from Asia. And where this is the issue, 2.5% from Africa, where Africa is going to be one of the populous regions of the world over the next 20 years. Employment, it, as I told you, we're talking about aquaculture in general, about 20 million people work in aquaculture, highest of course in Asia, and the rest is, rest is small, but this fisheries, much more 200 million, whereas about 20 million at the moment is working on aquaculture. We have uh, sustainable development goals, where fish plays in many, I'm very happy to see the fish boxes at the top, over there, all right? And uh, so we do contribute a lot to the sustainable development goals. This is something that I would just want to show you about uh, what we call greenhouse gases. Aquaculture is one of the most greenest production systems in the world. If you take a shellfish, a mussel, it will not emit anything, but it will absorb things from the environment. So it has a negative, in fact, emission rather than a positive emission. And whereas we have fish, carnivorous, herbivorous, omnivorous, you know, many, but if you take herbivorous animals, absolutely there is nothing that it emits, all it's green eating. So here you can see poultry ruminants, how much in 2050, whereas your seafood is much less compared to uh, ruminants. So it's a choice of for you whether you want to eat red meat or whether you want to eat fish. If you have read this book called Livestock's Long Shadow, it was probably published in 2015, I think by FAO. It tells, I think if I'm not wrong, more than 50% of the global desertification is a result of grazing by uh, cattle. I come, currently I work with the agency called Worldfish. Worldfish is one of the uh, CGIR research centers, um, and Worldfish is the only aquatic production CGIR center. We are based in Penang, uh, Malaysia, and we have currently a program called Fish, which we are looking at various opportunities of how fish can help people for three things, as I mentioned, nutrition, livelihood, and income. And our programs are sort of scattered all over the world. We have focal countries, Nigeria, Egypt, Tanzania, Zambia, four countries in Africa. And we have Myanmar, Bangladesh, Cambodia, and Solomon Islands, and also there are a few other uh, scaling countries. The research organization working particularly on uh, aquatic production and mainly fish, and uh, looking at the opportunities for making fish more available, more affordable, and more accessible to poor. Um, and uh, we are looking at the future. 
for fish and what is the nutrition towards a nutrition sensitive approach. We believe every agriculture production for the future, every including fish or every animal production system should be more nutrition sensitive, including nutrition sensitive agriculture for the future. And um, we, some of the, for years in my work in FAO, um, I was mainly responsible for forecasting for future, and my main um, interest was to look at how much fish is required from which part of the world, which region of the world, which countries, where the um, production should come from, where the trade should be happening. As you know, fish is one of probably the most traded commodity in the world. Last night, in the hotel dinner, I had a beautiful piece of uh, uh, salmon. I thought it is Norwegian salmon, but I don't know. It could be one day, it be Chinese salmon that I'll be eating in, in, in Sweden. I don't know. So the world in food production is incredible. Where it moves, where it, ha where it grown, where it is eaten, is an is a absolute maze. Um, so we are looking at future for 2030. Today we have 100 million tons nearly of, of, of fish from aquaculture. You will require at least 50 million tons more by 2030 in 10 more years to feed the world at the same level of, of consumption of 20 kilograms per person per year. But we believe it will go up with a bit more money in your pocket, more disposable income, with the increasing economies in the world, the people will move from eating red meat to white to fish, at least increasing two more meals a week of fish, which will you require nearly doubling the current production by 10 to 12 years. And that is the sector, and that is the type of development, type of growth required in the in, um, uh, aquaculture sector. We are working in Bangladesh, one of our major countries of research in fish and nutrition, particularly looking at women, empowerment, nutrition, child health is Bangladesh. And uh, we are looking at how much micronutrients, looking at the, Bangladesh is a beautiful country to work, and uh, a very versatile, and uh, full of water. On average, Bangladeshi, I think, eat more than 50 kilograms of fish per, per, per year. Um, and, and the question is, does aquaculture support the needs of the nutritionally vulnerable nations all over the world? I think we think, there are three categories of aquaculture. We are the product, very little production, countries like, you know, sort of a very, some of these countries. And then you have uh, export-oriented production. People make shrimp, people make very high-value commodities, not for the local consumption, but for this one. But I, we believe that people where they have reasonably good aquaculture, China, Southeast Asia, and they will have a much, much higher opportunity for making fish, particularly for improving the nutrition of their own countries and the national. But the others also can convert, provided that you have a reasonable policy change in the production and also the political will. Um, very interesting uh, discussion these days well, in our quarters how the fish will contribute to the future and improving nutrition and that we have seen very clearly in countries like Bangladesh, countries like uh, Indonesia, China, and that how much fish is contributing to improve nutrition. And we are now working with some support and first uh, ever investment by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on fish and we are working in Bangladesh and Nigeria and doing a complete, very in-depth survey of the role of fish for the Nigerian poor, with the hope that we will have a much higher investment over the coming years to help the Nigerian community. Um, as I said, this is, uh, this is a marine anchoviator from Sri Lanka. Right? And when my father, 
My father passed away about 12 years ago. Fred said he learned a lot of things from his grand grandma. When I was young, in my, our home, always in the dinner table and the lunch table, we always had spreads in the either cooked or fried spreads on the table. It was a must for my dad. I don't know whether he knew how important eating spreads for nutrition. It gives you calcium, it gives you zinc, it gives you omega-3s, it gives you vitamin A, you name it. But we had it. And this is the little fish that we get in the ponds of Bangladesh, where you have carps, where you have other species at the same time, little ones, what we call small indigenous species, SIS, and our research is trying to understand better how best you can have a polyculture system with the small indigenous species along with your carps, where the carps goes to the market and this little one goes to the kitchen. And these are self-recruited species where they are extremely important. And this little fish, thank you very much.